This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 52. Coming up on Space Time, a new type of stellar explosion. Rocket Lab catches an electron in midair and then drops it. And the first solar eclipse for 2022. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a new kind of stellar explosion which could be commonplace in the universe and may change science's understanding of how these eruptions in stars occur. They're called micronovae and they only last a couple of hours, which makes them difficult to observe. These outbursts happen on the surface of white dwarf stars and can rapidly burn through as much stellar material as 3.5 billion Great Pyramids of Giza. White dwarves are the stellar remnants of dead stars similar to the Sun. They're stars which have converted their core hydrogen into helium and then converted their core helium into oxygen and carbon. These stars aren't big enough to fuse oxygen and carbon into heavier elements and so the nuclear fusion process which makes stars shine ends. The outer layers of the stars are puffed off as planetary nebula, leaving behind the now exposed white-hot stellar core, a white dwarf, an object about the size of the Earth, which will now slowly cool over the eons. Astronomers have now observed these micronova explosions in three white dwarves. In each case, the white dwarf have been feeding on, that is, grabbing material off a nearby binary companion star, The discoveries reported in the journal Nature could not only lead to more micronovae being found, but it also challenges what science knows about how thermonuclear explosions occur in stars. The authors first came across this unusual phenomena when they noticed a bright flash of light lasting just a short period of time while they were analysing data from NASA's Planet Hunting Test Space Telescope, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Two of these newly discovered micronovae were observed coming from objects already known to be white dwarfs. But the third needed a little bit more detective work. So the authors used the X-Shooter instrument on the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile in order to get the status of the star as a white dwarf confirmed. The study's lead author, Simon Scaringi from Durham University, says these micronova phenomena are challenging science's understanding of how these thermonuclear blasts occur by proposing a totally new way of achieving them. He says it just goes to show how dynamic the universe is. And he thinks these events may actually be quite common, but because they're so ephemeral, they're difficult to catch in action. So what are we talking about here? Well, if we understand what we're seeing, micronovae are extremely powerful explosions, but on very small astronomical scales compared to their bigger counterparts, novae and supernovae, which are extremely bright and have been known about for centuries. In fact, there have been numerous accounts across history of so-called new stars or novae being seen by astronomers. They all involve thermonuclear explosions. Now, in the case of novae, this explosion occurs over the entire surface of the star. It's intensely bright and can be seen shining for weeks. Even more powerful are supernovae, massive explosions marking the death of a star, which can be so bright they'll outshine an entire galaxy and can remain visible for months, if not years. Now, while some supernovae are caused by the sudden core collapse of a progenitor star at least eight times the mass of the Sun, others, the thermonuclear supernovae, occur when a white dwarf star draws so much material off a companion star that it passes through an unstable phase known as the Chandrasekhar limit, which is about 1.44 times the mass of the Sun. This triggers a thermonuclear explosion, which completely destroys the white dwarf. Both novae and supernovae involved the white dwarf drawing material off a nearby companion star. As this material, it's usually hydrogen, falls onto the very hot surface of the white dwarf, the atoms fuse into helium in explosive fashion. In the case of a supernova, the explosion causes the destruction of the star. 
In the case of a nova, the explosion only destroys the material that's been dragged onto the star. And so the white dwarf itself isn't damaged and can continue to drag more and more material off a star until it again builds up enough material for another nova explosion. And this can be a repeating cycle. Astronomers think micronovae are similar explosions, but are smaller in scale and faster, lasting just a few hours. The authors think they occur on white dwarfs with strong magnetic fields, which then funnel this material towards the star's magnetic poles. It's the first time astronomers have seen how hydrogen fusion can happen in a localised way. It seems the hydrogen fuel can be contained to the base of the magnetic poles in some white dwarfs, so that the fusion only happens at these magnetic poles, not over the entire star. This leads to microfusion blasts going off, which have the strength of about maybe one millionth that of a normal nova explosion, hence the term micronova. The authors now want to try and capture more of these elusive events in order to better characterise their individual features. And that's going to require large-scale surveys and quick follow-up measurements. Scringy says rapid response from telescopes like the VLT or the European Southern Observatory's new technology telescope will allow astronomers to truly unravel the mystery of these events. Uh, Micronova are small versions of well-known nova and supernova. Uh, In a classical nova, what happens is uh, white dwarfs, which are uh, objects uh, with the mass of the sun but the size of the earth, they pull in material from a companion star, usually fresh hydrogen, and they build a layer around their surface. And when, once this layer uh, grows in temperature and pressure, the whole layer ignites thermonuclearly. Micronova, on the other hand, occur when the white dwarf is magnetic, and the magnetic field keeps the flow confined to a very small region onto the surface. And when, once this region gets hot enough and, and of high enough pressure, then only this region ignites, producing what we now know as a micronova. We have, with my collaborators, we have a, a program on TESS uh, to observe accreting white dwarfs. Now, TESS is a exoplanet finding mission uh, which looks at brightness variations of stars to look for transiting exoplanets. We have a program on TESS to look at accreting white dwarfs since 2018 now, and we have hundreds of light curves, i.e. monitoring the brightness variations of these objects. And the the light curves we get are extraordinarily interesting uh, and show a wide variety of behavior, but there was one specific uh, feature which kept us um, essentially awake at night for, for over a year. We couldn't explain it, until we, we, we made finally a connection that these may be thermonuclear explosions happening on, on accreting white dwarfs. We've known for uh, centuries of classical nova explosions, which are the result of building fresh uh, hydrogen on the surface layers of white dwarfs. Uh, what micronova are telling us is that these explosions can occur on localized areas of the white dwarfs. And these areas are localized because of the strong magnetic field of the white dwarf itself that allows material to be funneled into a very small region uh, until the temperature and pressure can grow to such an extent where that region only explodes thermonuclearly. Discovering micronova feels exciting. Uh, The reason is that these accreting white dwarfs are well-known systems. Some of them have well-known names taken from the constellation they they reside. And so for that reason, we thought we know them quite well. So discovering a new phenomena in something which supposedly is a well-known object, I think just goes to show how much more there is to find out. Uh, And that's, I think, what makes it exciting. What we hope to uh, learn now is to really understand what truly triggers these micronova events. We have a a, a model which we think explains our current observations, but we're not yet sure. And so the only way really to find out is to find more micronova, uh, which supposedly are, are plentiful, they're just really hard to find. And having found more micronova, hopefully we can try and develop our theories onto 
uh, how thermonuclear explosions can actually occur when material is magnetically confined onto a white dwarf. That's Simon Scaringi from Durham University, and this is Space Time. Still to come, Rocket Lab catches an electron in midair, but then drops it. And the first solar eclipse for 2022. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Rocket Lab has successfully undertaken the mid-air helicopter capture of an electron rocket following its launch. Well, almost. The There and Back Again mission blasted off from Rocket Lab's Mahia Peninsula Launch Complex 1A on the New Zealand North Island East Coast, carrying 34 small satellites into a 520 kilometre high sun synchronous orbit. We are counting down to the liftoff of Rocket Lab's 26th electron mission, There and Back Again. We will fly 34 spacecraft to space in our incredibly exciting secondary mission to catch a returning rocket booster from space with a helicopter. Today's launch will be the first time we try to bring back Electron's booster underneath a helicopter. It's all part of our plan to make Electron the world's first reusable orbital class small rocket, and this mission is the most advanced milestone in the program yet. It goes without saying, though, that catching a rocket mid-air with a helicopter is unconventional, and multiple factors need to align perfectly for today's first attempt to be a success. When it comes to R&D, we aim for the best, but we also plan for the worst, and our backup option today is our recovery vessel, stationed at sea near the recovery zone, and ready on standby to fish the booster from the ocean like on previous recovery missions if we needed to. Regardless of the outcome of today's recovery attempt, we will gather plenty of invaluable data to inform future attempts. We have recovered Electron's booster this way three times before on previous missions, where we used a parachute to slow Electron's first stage before landing it softly in the ocean to be retrieved by our recovery engineers from the vessel. For this mission, we're not only going big on recovery, but we have also stacked Electron's payload plate with the most number of satellites we have manifested for a single mission. There and back again will carry 34 satellites to a 520 kilometre circular Earth orbit, with payloads expected to begin deploying from Electron's kick stage at approximately T plus 53 minutes after liftoff. All operators, this is the LD on mission with a uh, go no go sequence poll stage. Stage is go. Avionics. Avionics is go. GNC. GNC is go. VCON. VCON is go. T1. T1 is go. GC. GC is go. PLS. PLS is go. RSO. RSO is go. MET. MET is go. MM. MM is go. LD sub. LD sub go. All operators, this is the LD on mission. Uh, go no go sequence is complete. We are go for terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. We are back on track because that is confirmation from mission control that the systems are healthy and we will be proceeding with the remainder of the count. The Electron's top clamp has opened and the strong back has moved away from the launch vehicle, retracting the strong back out of the way for Electron to power off the pad at T0. We remain go for launch with greens across the board for the launch vehicle, payloads, the weather and our recovery team. At T minus two minutes, Electron Electron will move to the countdown auto sequence, which is when the flight computers on the rocket take over the launch countdown from manual control. At T minus 1 minute 30 seconds, we should hear the call that locks loading is complete on Electron, telling us that the vehicle is fully fueled for launch. At T minus 1 minute, the call will come from mission control that Electron's first and second stages are pressurized for launch and the vehicle is ready. Then we'll move to the final countdown to lift off at T minus 10 seconds and engine ignition shortly before liftoff at T0. Let's go to Mission Control comms now and listen in to our launch director take us through the final count. LD GC on mission. Uh, go GC. ECS disabled, pad auto sequence is armed, pad is ready for launch. Copy. LD avionics mission. Uh, go ahead avionics. Every system is on instant power and enabled for flight. Roger, thank you sir. GNC, LD on mission. LD GNC. Uh, yes sir, confirm all expected recovery as goes are green and being monitored. Confirmed. All operators, this is the LD on mission with the LD go for launch. From now on, there should be no red flags on your critical LCCs. Vcon, LD on mission. LD Vcon. Confirm all expected flight computer as goes are green. Confirmed green. Vcon, lock auto sequence and confirm. Confirmed to lock. All operators, we are go for auto sequence start at T minus two minutes. LD is go for launch. Avionics, batteries have switched to internal power. Vehicle is fully on internal power. AFTS is green and enabled for flight. 
Lock load complete. Lock system in recirculation. All anti clustering disabled. Stage one and stage two are pressed for flight. High flow engine purge is enabled. Deluge is activated. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and we have liftoff. Propulsion is nominal. T plus 31 seconds into the mission, and Electron is airborne after our 26th launch from LC1. We are now at four kilometers in altitude, and very soon Electron will reach max Q. This is what's known as the point in the mission when the aerodynamic forces against the rocket are at their peak and cause the most amount of stress Electron will experience on its ascent. Vehicle has cleared max Q. Having cleared max Q, Electron's trajectory remains on track, and its propulsion is looking nominal as the mission continues to orbit. Soon we'll be coming up to the separation of the rocket stages that will signal the beginning of our electron recovery attempt. First up will be MECO or main engine cutoff on electrons first stage. This is when the rocket nine this is when the rocket's nine Rutherford engines on its first stage power down and then the rocket will drift for just a moment before the first and second stage separate. The second stage's engine should then start up and power the mission onto orbit while electrons booster begins its journey back toward the capture zone here on Earth. MECO confirmed. Stage separation success. Stage two ignition confirmed. And here we go. It is happening. Electron has successfully completed Miko. Stage separation and second stage engine start. Our electron recovery attempt is now officially in motion, and we are off to a fantastic start with this mission. As the mission continues for our customers, the fairing protecting their satellites will soon separate and fall away in preparation of payload deployment. Oh, and there it goes. Confirmation we were after of the fairing successfully deploying. A check of stage two speed and altitude tells us the mission is continuing nominally, currently at more than 125 kilometers above Earth and reaching speeds of more than 8,000 kilometers per hour. Onward to orbit. Stage two propulsion is nominal. Guidance is nominal. Following main engine cutoff, or MECO, first stage separation and second stage ignition, the Electron's core stage continued to coast to its target apogee. Now, during this time, the booster's reaction control system thrusters manoeuvred it into a descent configuration so that it could best handle the re-entry forces it'll endure during its fall of more than 80 kilometres back down towards the Earth's surface. Once it reached thicker atmosphere during its descent, the course stage released a drogue parachute, followed shortly afterwards by its main chute designed to slow its rate of descent dramatically. After deploying a drogue parachute at 13 kilometres or 8.3 miles altitude, the main parachute will be extracted at around 6 kilometres or 3.7 miles above Earth. This double deployment of chutes will help to dramatically slow the stage to a speed of just 36 kilometres or 22.3 miles per hour. This allowed it to glide towards to capture zone, some 275 kilometers downrange in the South Pacific Ocean from its launch pad. As the booster gently floated down under its orange and white parachute canopy, a Sikorsky S-92 recovery helicopter, which was hovering nearby, successfully swooped in and snagged the booster in mid-air by its chute line at an altitude of 1,980 meters. Okay, so mission accomplished. Well, not quite. Apparently, the parachute began billowing, increasing the load on the chopper and forcing the helicopter pilots to release the booster 20 seconds after capture. But luckily, with the parachute full of air, the booster then simply continued to float down to the sea under the chute for what was a very soft splashdown. A nearby recovery boat was then used to retrieve the booster from the ocean and take it back to Rocket Lab for examination. The core stage recovery operation is designed to allow Rocket Lab to refurbish and reuse its boosters in a similar way to SpaceX's reuse of their Falcon 9 rockets. Of course, unlike the Falcon 9, which undertakes a powered landing under its own rocket engines, the smaller Electron uses up all its fuel during the launch, and so it needs to rely on the parachutes for a safe return to Earth. Holding on Electron second stage engine is continuing nominally and firing hot as the mission continues to orbit. All payloads on the stage remain healthy and ready for release to their 520 kilometer circular orbit. Taking a look at the telemetry, Electron second stage continues on its journey to orbit at a speed of over 11,000 kilometers an hour and an altitude of more than 220 kilometers. We are coming up to the next gate for Electron second stage to clear, the battery hot swap for its Rutherford engine. This engine is the world's first to use the 
the electric pump feed cycle for orbital space travel. To keep the propellant pump system going all the way to orbit, we swap out the batteries as they are drained with a new set to keep the system running. Battery jettison confirmed. State ship propulsion holding nominal. Guidance is nominal. Battery hot swap is confirmed. The second stage is continuing nominally on its mission for our customers. Very soon, we are also expecting Seco on the final stage separation of the kick stage. We'll wait for those calls. Guidance is in terminal, 27 seconds remaining. It's a bit longer of a second stage burn than normal to get us to our 520 kilometre SSO orbit. Seeker. Stage three separation confirmed. Normal transfer orbit achieved. The Rutherford engine on Electron stage two has successfully shut down and stage two and the kick stage will have cleanly separated. The kick stage will now enter what we call a coasting phase while it's in an elliptical orbit before its carry engine ignites and propels it into its sun synchronous orbit where we will deploy the satellites. The first satellites to separate will be the three on board from eSpace in a demonstration of its technologies for its future sustainable satellite system. The satellites have small cross sections designed to decrease the risk of collisions with untrackable space objects and can automatically deorbit if any system malfunctions occur. Next will be the first of two stacks of Space Bees for Internet of Things Constellation Operator Swarm. Then we'll have the deployment of the Bro6 satellite by Unseen Labs, a French company developing a constellation of satellites that detect radio frequency signals in marine monitoring. Today's mission is the third launch Rocket Lab has provided for Unseen Labs to expand this constellation. And then after Unseen Labs will come the Aurora Sat 1, also known as the Flying Object from Aurora Propulsion Technologies. This satellite will demonstrate space junk removal technologies for small satellites, including propulsion devices and plasma brakes that enable the sustainable use of space. Next will be the four PICO satellites from Alpha. Orbital. This cluster of tiny spacecraft includes ALBA's Unicorn 2 Pocket Cube satellite, which carries an optical nighttime imaging payload designed to monitor light pollution across the globe. The other satellites are the TRSI-2, the TRSI-3, and a My Radar one Each of these small satellites carry a unique sensor designed to demonstrate innovative technologies on orbit. And then last but not least on the manifest is Copia from Asterix Astronautics, a technology demonstration that will remain attached to the kick stage as it tests its deployment system designed to improve on power restraints typically seen in small satellites. This is space time. Still to come, the first solar eclipse for 2022, and later in the science report, meteorologists confirmed that the past Northern Hemisphere summer was the hottest on record across Europe. All that and more still to come on space time. South America and the Antarctic have witnessed the first solar eclipse for the year, with the moon partially blocking out the sun in an arc sweeping from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Although visually still impressive, the only slight dimming of the surroundings during the partial eclipse was far less noticeable because of the thick cloud cover which hampered the spectacle for many. A partial eclipse happens when the moon passes partially in front of the sun's disk as seen from the Earth during a new moon. Usually, the Moon's orbit around the Earth passes either above or below the direct line of sight between the Earth and the Sun. But every now and then, the Earth, Moon and Sun line up in such a way that the Moon directly blocks Earth's view of the Sun. Now, although the Moon's 400 times smaller than the disk of the Sun, it's also 400 times closer to the Earth, and so it's large enough to completely block out the face of the Sun. Well, usually... Every now and then a type of solar eclipse called an annular eclipse happens when the moon is a bit further away from the Earth than usual. That's because its orbit around the Earth isn't circular but rather elliptical. And being further away from the Earth, it appears a little bit smaller in the sky. When this happens, the moon's no longer big enough to cover the entire surface of the sun and instead leaves a fiery ring around the sun, producing an annulus, hence the term annular eclipse. Last week's event was the first of two partial solar eclipses to occur this year. The second will be on October the 25th, and it should be visible for sky watchers in Europe, Western Asia, and Northeastern Africa. Now, as always happens with solar eclipses, there will be a matching lunar eclipse coming up on May the 15th, and it will be visible in the Americas, Europe, and Africa. 
Lunar eclipses happen two weeks before or after a solar eclipse during the full moon phase because of the same lineup of celestial bodies, but this time it's the Earth which gets between the Sun and the Moon rather than the Moon getting between the Earth and the Sun. For listeners on the United States East Coast, the spectacle will begin around 22.30 in the evening, with the moon well above the horizon and totality starting about an hour later and lasting for around 90 minutes. For listeners in the American Midwest, the show gets underway about an hour and a half after dark, with the moon relatively low in the sky, while on the West Coast, totality will already be underway by the time the moon rises. Unlike a solar eclipse, lunar eclipses are quite safe to look at directly with your eyes or through a telescope or binoculars. As the eclipse begins, the moon will start to take on a pinkish or reddish hue as the light from the sun is refracted through the Earth's atmosphere before reaching the face of the moon. Think of it as shining with all the Earth's sunrises and sunsets happening at once. It happens because of a process called Rayleigh scattering, which allows only the longer red wavelengths to pass through the atmosphere. Particles in the Earth's atmosphere, from things like volcanic eruptions, dust and even fires, will act to further redden the light that reaches the Moon's surface. It'll be a spectacular event to watch, and I thoroughly recommend it. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 